Sometimes, as we explore the world around us, we are fortunate enough to stumble upon features that excite and puzzle us all at the same time. It can be quite an adventure looking for clues, making observations, and developing theories as to the origin of mysterious features. Why, hello out there. I'm Myron Cook. One of the many things I enjoy about geology is as I hike around, I see things that other people that don't have geology skills don't even see or aren't able to enjoy. So it makes my hikes more enjoyable, I'd like to think anyway. And as you go along with me on videos, I hope that you'll gain the skills of reading the rocks and seeing things in a different way and enjoy the great outdoors even more. Now the other day I was out here in this very area a couple weeks ago just hiking trying to see new areas and I stumbled upon something that's pretty darn interesting in my view and so I want to hike over and see that and explore the options as to what we think it is. So let's get started shall we? As I hike along, you know, I'm thinking about enjoying geology as you hike different areas. And that occurred to my wife and me about a week ago. We were at Mount Rushmore. And yeah, the sculptures in the granite there were spectacular. But you know, there was some fascinating geology. <laughs> and as we hiked along the trail, uh, we were seeing some really beautiful uh, geology. And of course, we were stopping enjoying that right along with the sculptures. While, while all the people, uh, they had no idea what was there. Nobody that I noticed ever even looked and saw it at all. So that's, as I say, a fun part of all this. Well, we're getting close now to this feature. I sure hope you find it as interesting as I did at the time, a couple weeks ago, or whatever it was. Isn't this fascinating? that sphere that sits underneath and you can see a hole where it went. It's like a ball and a hole that it sat in. Let's look around the other side here, get a three-dimensional perspective. Yeah, it's like a, a half sphere, isn't it? Interesting texture on it. Now if we come back and look at that ball a little closer, I find that kind of interesting myself. See what we think. Huh, it's kind of covered in silt. I think I'll clean that off and take a look at it. But it's sure interesting, isn't it? Okay, so I've cleaned off the ball a little just so we can see what's underneath that silt and sand. And it's got a darker look to it, doesn't it? I think it's a darker color than this outer sphere. Uh, so, interesting. Fascinating, isn't it? You know, I thought it'd be fun to involve my fan base, so I sent out an email to them, those that have subscribed to my newsletter, and asked them to give me some impressions of what it looks like. Don't worry about the geology or anything. Some of them responded with geologic ideas and others not. But it was fun to get the feedback. Let me give you a few examples. <clears throat> Several of them thought it looked like a mushroom. Yeah, it does look like the top of a mushroom. Maybe they're ancient sponges, said uh, someone that goes by cork. Uh, Several thought that it was kind of reminded them of a fruit, you know, with a, uh, the pit of like a peach or something. Uh, kid curry, a hip joint. Yeah, you do have kind of a ball and socket feel to that. Um, a brain coral, maybe, uh, says Scott. Or maybe Sean, as Sean said, it's a native grindstone that's lying on its side that it was used to grind things with. Or maybe it's some kind of a game, said uh, Grandma Mich Michelle. Uh, of course, some of them thought that it could be dinosaur eggs and, and mentioned that, well, it's a little too round maybe to be an egg, but it, it reminds you of that. Um, maybe an oversized cave pearl, as Mitchell said. 
Henry and others said it, it reminded them of a giant clam with a pearl inside. Yeah. Some invoked volcanic activity, which is interesting because we do have volc uh, volcanic or volcanoes that were active at the time to the west. So that's fascinating. It could be a volcanic bomb, uh, what they call a bomb, a, a molten blob that flew out and maybe landed in water or something and, and cooled off in a spherical shape. Uh, a fellow by the name of Cap, who I know, hello Cap, he thought, well, maybe it could be uh, just two different fluids of different densities, like a lava lamp lamp, excuse me, where you have two densities and if you, if you have one fluid that's different, it, it can form a sphere floating in that fluid and that maybe something like that could happen. So a lot of fascinating thoughts. It reminds you of a lot of interesting things as far as the shapes and what they potentially could be. So now with that, I'm not going to talk much more about this now. We're going to come back to this and talk to, about this uh, particular feature and others that are around here, but I want to go to a place that's about a hundred miles away that I think is going to help us understand what's going on here, because I think you can relate those to this. So let's go there. Driving along the highway, this outcrop of rocks caught my eye. In particular, I noticed rusty colored rocks scattered about and also protruding from the rock face. Well, these are some interesting, I'll call them blobs. Big, almost like boulders in this layer of rock. I walked up the dip slope, or the slope of the natural formation that has been folded on the front of the Thermopolis Anticline, is the name of it. It's dipping about 18 degrees. I'm within the amazing frontier formation. And I see these big blobs here in this layer, about 25 feet down from the top or so. And as a geologist, I'm thinking, could these parts out here be some of this too that is weathered out? So let me go back into, into this layer of rock just a ways, or does it go further? Are they all through here? So in my mind, what I'd really like to see is that this layer of rock stripped down, just gently stripped down to reveal a bigger, broader surface to see what these really look like, and can they give us some clues about what we've seen earlier? So I want to look around just a little more as a geologist should, making some observations and continuing to look at this layer and see if we can find an area that's even better. And I have a suspicion we're going to. With the help of the drone, let's get some broader context. Here I am for scale. I'm walking up the nose of a large fold referred to as the Thermopolis Anticline. The sandstones are within the 95 million year old Cretaceous Age Frontier Formation. I've drawn these lines to show how the sandstones were once folded some 65 million years ago during the Laramide orogeny. Of course, the top part of this fold has been deeply eroded. The width of the fold shown by the lines is over one and a half miles wide, and it extends way off into the distance that we can't really see. It's 26 miles long. Let's follow the sandstone along the flank of the fold and look for better exposures. Walking through this amazing scene, I ponder the history that brought it to view. I hope that you take the opportunities available to you to explore your natural surroundings.
Now this is fun, isn't it? We've found the layer where we had these blobs in the outcrop in the side of the hill. We've thought how interesting they may be. We made a few observations there. We want to follow that layer out around the side of the anticline where it's exposed and see if we might find better opportunities to study these spheres or these blobs. And here we are. Boy, have we ever been lucky, haven't we? We've now, the top 25 feet or so of the frontier formation has eroded gently down to slowly reveal these spheres, which obviously are more resistant to erosion than the sandstone that they're encased in, and hence they're eroded out in this beautiful relief. Now, we've had a lot of ideas about these spheres. We've talked about what they remind us of, the shapes, etc. In fact, I had a local older gentleman stop by just a bit ago, and he was wondering if they were brought in by glaciers. So there you go, another idea. So it's time to get to business. We've made a few observations, but we need to make some more serious ones. So let's walk around, make a few key observations, and then talk about what we really believe, and narrow down our ideas, and come to hopefully an answer that's satisfactory. So let's get started. The first simple thing we can do is make observations about the feel of them, just how they feel to the hand. Ah, just as I expected, it feels rough. I don't know if you'll see it on, uh, in video, but I see tiny little sparkles. Those are from feldspar crystals. The faces of them reflect the light. We have the beautiful lichen on the surface, so they like it. And that's because it's a sandstone. I've looked at it with my hand lens, and it's a very nice sandstone. So that's an important observation. Let's carry on. Coming up into this area, we see kind of a different surface texture to these spheres. Uh, I see kind of a subtle layering within those, like bedding is what I see. Now, I have some experience with this, so it's a little easier for me to see, but these lines that, that go across these spheres, you see them all through here, they're weathered out in that way. So those are depositional layers within the sandstone that are preserved within the spheres. So uh, another key observation. Most of these are very spherical in nature, although sometimes they do get some irregular shapes. So if I come right over here and take a look, we see one that's kind of a, a longer shape, kind of a tube shaped almost. Short tube, but nevertheless, it's not spherical. And in this area, we see multiple spheres that kind of merge together. If you can see this, <clears throat> yeah, they touch and merge together. I've seen several like that. So they're not always isolated spheres. Another nice example of these spheres that kind of merge together. Sometimes they almost look like dinner rolls that have been baked together. Here is one that has quite a long shape to it. And then right at the very end, up there in the shadows, a nice little round ball at the end. Here's one that is split. Uh, there are not too many of them that are split here. And I've looked inside. I don't see anything unusual inside along that fracture face. Here is a nice half sphere where it has been split pretty much in the middle along here. And again, I don't see anything unusual. I see evidence of layering or bedding within the rock here, but that's about it. Okay, observations and how they affect the way we interpret what we see. First thing, the observation that these are made of sandstone. What does that do to all the various thoughts that we've had about these spheres and odd shaped bodies? Well, in my mind, that means anything fossilized is out because fossils are not made of sandstone. When you look at petrified wood or fossils, whatever type they might be, they're not composed of sandstone. So that takes all the, you know, the corals and sponges, sponges, etc., that we've talked about. Another thing that it obviously removes is this thought that maybe somehow volcanics or volcanism was somehow involved directly. So it's not volcanic rock because, again, it's sandstone. 
Well, this is quickly narrowing things down, isn't it? Just that one simple observation. What about some type of ancient civilization? Hmm. Well, when you look around here, it's really hard to think of a reason why there would be so many of these large spheres made for some purpose by an ancient civilization. So that's really difficult to get your head around. Another one is, as we saw in the prior outcrop, they were embedded in with a, within a layer of rock, which happens to be the frontier formation. And so, boy, that would make it super duper old uh, to take civilization back to them. So we can confidently say it has nothing to do with uh, man-made processes, shall we say. Uh, I might bring up the glaciers somehow transported. What do you think there? You think it through and you go, well, glaciers can round rocks a fair bit. I've never seen them round things to this nature, but maybe the more important thing is large glacial rocks, even if they are getting rounded and polished in some cases, they're very durable. This sandstone actually isn't that durable. And then you have to wonder why all these spheres here and Actually, glaciers that there are no documented glaciers that get out here. So, uh, again, at least as a geologist, you know, with my background as a geologist, that's a pretty simple one to discard for, for those reasons. And there are others. So now we're down to the, the special geologic process. And I know there are many of you out there that already know what, what I'm coming to, don't you? And that is because you're f familiar with some of these in some other areas, they're actually fairly common. They're called concretions. Okay, so what? You have a fancy word. Let's talk about how they form. So I'm going to turn to my trusty whiteboard. I've sketched several layers of rock. We've got a cross-sectional view. Here's my fancy little tree here. We have layers of rock that are deposited on top of each other through time. Now, I've mentioned before, but I'll continue to mention this because I've noticed it surprises people, is that as layers of rock are deposited, all this pore space or holes within the rock fill with cement. Cement precipitates within it. Usually it's like uh, silica or quartz, you can think of it, that fill those pores, or calcium carbonate. Those are the two most common. Uh, and so they, they get cemented as they're buried. But this particular process to form concretions is really just an early cementation. So early in the process, we have a layer. These dots represent, represent sandstone. So I have three layers of sandstone. Let's focus on here. I've put a dot here to represent often, not always, but often we see in the middle of these concretions some, some uh, leaf or twi piece of twig, very small can be, or an animal that cement, it, it provides a seed point for cement to start precipitating around it and growing out radially. Now for it to grow out radially and in a sphere, this uh, sandstone needs to be a really nice homogeneous clean sandstone. Because if it has irregular properties, of course, it's going to be hard for that cement to grow in such a nice sphere, almost like a crystal. So I've put a dot here to represent that. And we just have, through time, cement just building out in a three-dimensional sphere to create these nice spheres that we see, these concretions. Now, of course, we've noticed irregular shaped ones. In fact, uh, many of you will have seen my video on giant petrified trees that are, in fact, I hate to spoil it here, concretions. So we get these irregular ones, too, and they can be really crazy looking. Let's think about that. How could that be? And that is, not all sandstone is homogeneous, okay? So we can have this layer of sandstone and there can be three-dimensional shapes within it where fluid travels more easily. It has higher permeability. And if that occurs, that means more water laden with minerals is passing through that area, whereas other parts of the sandstone uh, are not as permeable. And so less minerals. So think of that. So you could have a three-dimensional shape, a tube, a log shape, or very common out here, where more fluids pass through, more cement is uh, deposited or precipitated, I should say, within the pores, 
and you cement this weird shape. Now later, this is early cementation, as you continue to bury, all the sandstone gets uh, cemented to some level. And that's why we see it in outcrops here where you have a pretty good sandstone and within it are these blobs and spheres that are weathering out. And uh, because it's more resistant, even though it's all cemented, this cement, there's more of it, or it may be a different type of cement that is more resistant to erosion. It might be more, have more iron in it, and iron oxide, which is common out here, gives us this rusty color. I almost always see some more iron in the concretions in, in the Bighorn Basin. So there you go. That's the formation of concretions. I'm continually amazed at the diversity of inspiring scenes that I encounter in nature. Sometimes they are interesting geologic features, and other times it's the vegetation thriving on high mountain slopes. I think it's pretty clear now that the first feature that we saw is a concretion that has been split in two, giving us this half sphere. Let's go back to this area and explore some more. Well, we've learned a lot about concretions together, haven't we? We've seen some really beautiful concretions. Most of them large spheres, which is kind of fun for this. But I wanted to come back and talk about these, the early uh, concretions that I showed you, where you have the ball that's sitting underneath, or within, I should say. And those tend to be darker color. And then the outer part tends to be lighter. And I want you to think for a minute, how is it that you can have that occur in a concretionary uh, situation? And if you think about it a minute, I'm sure you'll come with the same conclusion that I have, or at least I like to think that. And that is that the chemistries of the groundwater change through time. So let's imagine in our heads together for a minute. You have groundwaters that are relatively iron rich, building a concretion within the sandstone. And then, at, at some point, let's say the concretion's this size, just for the fun of it, the chemistry of the water changes and it doesn't have as much iron. But the concretionary process continues. So it builds an outer larger sphere that has less iron in it and more calcium carbonate type cement that is growing and creating this concretion. That's a fairly simple scenario and I think it's the most likely one. So now that your eyes are tuned into these spheres and some of the characteristics of them, you can see them easily, can't you? We've got a sphere within a sphere here. Beautifully eroded one. I like this one. Well, this is a fun area. See some half spheres, some sitting in the, in the ground somewhat. Uh, here's a nice half sphere here, and if you look, you see an outer rind with a, a ball in the middle. This one's pretty big. That's uh, easily a foot across. As we've learned, concretions are not always spherically shaped. This one certainly has an interesting look to it, and notice that the interior portion of it is quite large. Well, Mother Nature seems to provide a lot of variability. In this particular one, the interior seems to be less resistant to weathering. Hanging on to the sandstone ledge, this one will soon split in two. So with that, uh, that's the end of this video, and I hope you've enjoyed it. And more importantly, I hope it motivates you, for those that can anyway, to get out Explore your surroundings and imagine what might be occurring around you. It doesn't matter if you're wrong, it's just fun. The process is fun and you can think about the bigger world around you. Thank you for watching.